Hello wonderful person, this is Anton, and today we're going to be discussing some new advances in how we generate energy for various space missions. And more specifically, the confirmation from various agencies that we might have discovered a completely new efficient way to generate energy for various long-term missions on various objects out there, including various moons in the solar system that might not provide enough sunlight for, for example, solar panels to be used for generation of energy. But in this case, our story starts right here. The announcement from the Chinese Space Agency that they recently tested this technology in space on top of their space station that we've discussed in one of the previous videos in the description, and it seems to work really well. And in this case, this is referred to as the Stirling Thermoelectric Converter, making this the first in-orbit test, indicating that it seems to work in space in zero-g conditions. You can learn more about this in the article in the description as well. But one thing you're not going to know from this article is that this is far from a new technology, and NASA has been actively testing this for the past 20 years. As a matter of fact, many different missions in the future are most likely going to start using this technology because it's actually really efficient and is able to successfully function producing quite a lot of energy for at least 20 years. And so in this video, we're going to discuss a little bit more about this technology, what it sort of represents, and where all of this is headed. But first, let's start with the details of how this actually functions. Technically, these are known as Storling Radioisotope Generators, I guess SRG for short. And just like the more famously known RTGs or Radioisotope Thermoelectric Generators, the ones used in various missions including New Horizons and of course the Perseverance currently operating on Mars, these generators use various types of isotopes, usually plutonium or sometimes uranium, to basically produce heat. A typical pellet looks something like this. And this is a pellet of an oxide of plutonium-238 that's naturally able to produce heat as it dissociates into lighter elements. And because it has a half-life of 87 years, it's able to do so successfully without losing too much power for several decades. And that's of course why Voyager probes are still active even after 5 decades. Their RTG is a little bit different, but still uses very similar principles. Naturally, some elements are a little bit better and produce a little bit more energy, but they also have much shorter half-lives, or vice versa, and some are maybe not as safe as well. For example, strontium, even though it is efficient, is not very safe. But the problem with these particular devices is the way that the energy is generated. It uses what's known as thermoelectric effect. If you're an older computer nerd, you probably know what these are. These are Peltier devices, also known as Seebeck modules, which basically convert electricity into heat on one side and very cold region on the other side. Back in the days, people used these to try to cool down their CPU instead of using an actual heatsink. I actually tried one of these and I almost burned down my CPU. But anyway, the thing is, you can actually do the opposite. If you were to apply heat on one side and make the other side very cold, it would then actually start generating electricity. And by attaching a permanent heat source and making the other side permanently cool, such as for example by putting it in space, you can create a permanent current that constantly generates electricity for, actually, decades. Similar technologies are used in, for example, refrigerators and also some air conditioners as well. But there is a bit of a problem here. They're not very efficient, actually exceptionally inefficient. From all of the heat received, they only convert approximately 6% or sometimes even lower than that of total energy. Most of the other heat is just dissipated by the rest of the material and is basically lost. But the scientists still wanted to find a way to use these pellets because they basically provide permanent energy and because they believe there has to be a more efficient way to convert all of this heat into functional electricity. And so even though most missions to date have used RTGs, since the late 1990s and early 2000s, a lot of NASA scientists have tried to focus on something else. They realized that we can actually use some of the earlier technology to try to do the same. In this case, a typical Stirling engine. The engine that uses hot air and cold air to drive some kind of a piston that then drives some kind of a turbine or something else. Something that we've actually been using for over a hundred years and something that we understand pretty well with so many different designs already in existence. And so early on the scientists realized what if we actually pair this with one of these nuclear reactors where the heat is produced by the pellet it then heats up some kind of a gas, the gas creates pressure and drives something on the inside creating the necessary work, which then generates electricity. So far, so good. With just maybe one problem. We would want this to function for maybe two decades without the need for any repair, mostly because you don't actually want to open these. It is radioactive after all. 
And so in other words, they wanted to create an equivalent of RTG with maybe as few moving parts as possible, way more efficient, and using the Sterling technology. And it didn't take them long to come up with something that looks like this. This is essentially the initial design. It's a radioisotope based Sterling engine that doesn't actually use a lot of parts that touch and does not use a lot of moving parts as well. It is however based on pistons that move across without touching pretty much anything, and their motion moves a magnet that then generates electricity by interacting with a coil around the cylindrical shape. With all of this done many many times for decades at a time. Ok, so far so good. Pretty cool design. Does it actually work? Well here's the thing. Apparently NASA has been running this test since the early 2000s. As a matter of fact back in 2022 NASA wrote a small article about this showcasing these incredible discoveries. They refer to this as TDC number 13, Technology Demonstration Converter. It sort of looks like this and has been running in the Glenn Research Center in Ohio since 2003, operating for over 100,000 hours, generating constant electricity during all of this time. And more importantly, it contains no moving parts, it has shown no wear whatsoever, and contains just a small amount of helium gas on the inside that's used to increase pressure in order to drive all of this. In other words, the simulation you see right here that was released back in 2013 is actually showing us something that was active for over a decade. This is already a functioning technology that works really well, and I'm actually kind of surprised that not a single NASA mission has used this so far for prolonged periods of time. And because all of this is pretty much based on magnets, and simply uses oscillating magnet moving across affecting the wires nearby, there's really no moving parts whatsoever and no wear and tear. Nothing here touches anything. Which is kind of different from a typical engine, such as the one used in various cars, where the pistons do have a ring to create a seal, which causes friction and does wear out. You also need to regularly apply oil in order to reduce friction. Nothing like that is required here. And more importantly, it's clear that this is something that can last for at least 20 years. But what about efficiency? It is absolutely ridiculous how efficient this is. At least 20% compared to 6 or even lower from the RTGs. In other words, this is at least 3.5 times more efficient than the previously used RTG. Which is why a few years ago, back in 2015, NASA proposed Kilopower Project. They wanted to create a nuclear reactor easily capable of creating at least 1000 watts of power for over 20 years in any conditions anywhere. None of the RTGs are capable of doing this, with most only being able to create a few hundred watts. And so for the past few years they've been actually testing something known as Krusty, kilopower reactor using Sterling technology. This is a joint operation between NASA and DARPA and is scheduled to be tested in space in 2027. As a matter of fact, it's most likely what's going to be powering the missions on the surface of the moon. The current NASA study has already shown that it's possible to create a reactor with 40 kilowatt of power, able to support a crew of 4 to 6 astronauts and a small colony. And that's on top of not requiring any maintenance and basically being a reactor that you kind of set up and forget about. Oh, and it's also super safe. And as early as 2018, it's already received several major tests, confirming that it's able to operate in really high temperatures and was even able to produce 5.5 kilowatt of power for at least 28 hours, making this the ultimate power source for any mission where light is no longer an option. For example, any mission on Jupiter, Saturn, Neptune or Uranus would just not have enough light for solar panel use and any other energy source would most likely not work. As a matter of fact, the Juno mission that's orbiting Jupiter right now is basically the limit of solar panel use in the solar system and in this case these are really really big, more massive than they should be. But it's also mostly used as a kind of a test of technology and because back in the days when it was launched there was a bit of a shortage of plutonium. Not really the case anymore though. And so it looks like we now have a very efficient way to generate energy for a long time for many different space missions in the future. But even though China has now officially tested it in space and it seems to work for them as well, it's quite likely that it's going to be NASA that's going to functionally use these in one of the future missions including the Artemis mission in 2027. As a matter of fact what China has now achieved, NASA was basically doing 20 years ago. Just the initial test, just to see if the technology works. What I guess the irony of all of this is that looks like we're going back to the steam engines to produce energy just like we did hundreds of years ago. Although there's something really cool about the fact that this is not just steam engine, it's a helium steam engine using nuclear technology and various magnetic coils to generate electricity in a very different way. So basically steam engine of the future. And so at this point it's just kind of curious to see 
who's actually going to be the first to use these in an actual mission, and what's going to be the first NASA mission to finally switch to this new technology. Now we're probably going to find out in the next few years, but until then, check out all of the relevant links in the description below. Thank you for watching, subscribe, share this with someone who loves learning about space and sciences, come back tomorrow to learn something else, and maybe support this channel on Patreon by joining channel membership or by buying a wonderful person t-shirt you can find in the description. Stay wonderful, I'll see you tomorrow, and as always, bye bye.